Welcome back to CTV News Channel. I'm Morella Fernandez. From the Mars lander beaming back crystal clear images of the red planet to a Canadian astronaut back on the International Space Station. 2018 has been an exciting year in space exploration. So let's take a look back at some of those stories with science journalist Dan Riskin. Joins us in studio. Dan, thanks for coming in. A pleasure. What a year, hey? What a year. Let's start with the Parker Solar Probe because that's pretty big. It's circling the sun to what end? Well, okay, so this, the sun is just this, it's the thing that lights up our whole world. But just the thing. It's way too dangerous to get close to, right? And so there are all these questions that people have been asking for 60 years. Here's a basic one. How come the atmosphere of the sun is hotter than the surface of the sun? How does that work? How does that work? How does that work? So they're sending a probe. And what's amazing about the engineering of this probe is it's going to be the fastest, actually it already is the fastest thing a human's ever built. It's going like Mach 500 or something like that when it gets up to full speed. Uh, it's getting closer to the sun than anything a human's ever sent there. Uh, it's going to be about a tenth the distance from the sun that Mercury is. So really close. And even though the temperature outside is going to be like 2,500 degrees, it's going to be room temperature inside the probe. The engineering is just amazing on this stuff, and they are going to be able to address some of these big questions about how the sun does what it does. How long is the mission here? The mission goes on for several years, but what's amazing about this is that it launched this year in 2018 and got there this year in 2018. There's another mission that goes to Mercury. That launched this year, and it's going to take seven years to get to Mercury because it has to slow down to get there so it doesn't miss it. Got it. The probe actually sent down a photo already. Yes, it's been taking pictures. It's been sending back beautiful data. And what's really striking, I mean, that bright light you see there is Jupiter, and those other little dots that look like moons or something, those are actually uh, an effect of the photography. So it, it, because everything's so bright and so intense there, it doesn't look quite right. So you have to sort of ignore those. But it, it works. It works the way it's supposed to. And we're excited to see if we can learn how the sun does what it does. Got it. All right, let's get to another uh, big story. In October, there was a launch of a Soyuz rocket, but it didn't uh, end well. Well, you know what? It depends how you define well. Everybody lived. So uh, this was, it was supposed to take off from Kazakhstan, like so many Soyuz rockets before it, fly up to the International Space Station. There was an American and a, and a Russian inside the spacecraft, but it, things did not go according to plan. So you can imagine they're sitting inside that Soyuz spacecraft. It's accelerating up. They can feel themselves being pushed into their seats. And then as at this moment where they're supposed to still be pushed, all of a sudden they're weightless. And they know, well, it's only been two minutes. We're not supposed to be weightless yet. And what had happened was that there was a, something wrong with the booster disconnecting. It didn't disconnect properly. And so it sent the Soyuz spacecraft into what they call a parabolic trajectory, which is a fancy way of saying that it was just hurtling back towards the Earth like a baseball. And it did some rotations, but the way it's designed is so good that it got oriented correctly, its parachute went off, and uh, about three minutes later, they were on the ground, uh, just a few hundred kilometers from where they'd taken off, and they'd survived. So it was the best possible failure you could have. <laughs> best possible failure, I like that. But unnerving for the next set of astronauts that had to go up not too long after. Unnerving for everybody. And of course, David Saint-Jacques was watching this with bated breath because he was supposed to be on the next trip up. But after that happened, they succeeded successfully sent four Soyuz spacecrafts without anybody in them up uh, so that they could make sure that everything was working. They identified what the problem was. It looks like something got bumped during final assembly when they were putting it together. So there are going to be some conversations, I'm sure, in Russia about how all that works. But ultimately, uh, they did get it right because David Saint-Jacques was the next one to go up. And it's great to have him up there. It feels like Canadians are putting these folks up in space who are not just smart, but also really good communicators and are able to tell people in plain language what they're doing, why they're going, and how much they're enjoying it. Exactly, yeah, and I think that's, I mean, Chris Hadfield, of course, is everybody's favorite. He's, he set the mark. He set the bar for everybody who goes up to space about what you can do to engage people. And I think space had sort of, it was sort of something we were taking for granted. And then he went up there and started playing his guitar and singing Bowie songs mm -hmm. and talking about hockey and how tears wipe away in space and how you shave in space. And he just, he brought it all home. And so David Saint-Jacques has that example to follow in. He's the first Canadian to go up since Hadfield. Hadfield was in 2013, it's 2018 now. So it's been a full five years. David Saint-Jacques, um, it's interesting. I heard Hadfield talk about him and Had Hadfield was asked, how do you think he's gonna follow in your footsteps? And he said, well, he can't play guitar like I do, but I can't do science like David Saint-Jacques. Wow. David Saint-Jacques is, is a astronaut's astronaut. This guy is a full-on engineer. He worked as an engineer. Then he went back to school and got his PhD in astrophysics uh, from Cambridge University in the UK, uh, and then worked in that field for a while, and then went back to school and became a full medical doctor. 
So this guy just can't get enough of the learning. And after that, he decided he wanted to be an astronaut. And so he's doing that, but he's doing experiments that have to do with astrophysics and have to do with human medicine. And he has the expertise. He's the best person in the world to have up there, never mind the best Canadian. And so we're very excited to see what these six months are going to be like for him. And it'll be the longest trip to the ISS by any Canadian in history by the time he's done. Well, wow. let's get to SpaceX, of course. They launched a Tesla uh, into space, but I really didn't understand the point of that mission. Well, it was the most expensive car commercial anyone's ever exactly. done. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars going to these launches. But SpaceX uh, is sort of one of the, the leading private companies that's trying to take over the trips to space. And this is, uh, at the time, the biggest rocket in the world, a Falcon Heavy. It's basically a whole bunch of smaller rockets taped together. And what makes it amazing, there are a whole bunch of things that make it amazing, but it's got three basic rockets that are riding up all duct taped together. And then after it sends this capsule into space, those three rockets go back to Earth and land properly. And so what was even more striking than the Tesla commercial that came out of this, when the capsule opened up and showed that they launched a, a Tesla Roadster into space with a little astronaut riding in it, is that the rockets went back to Earth and landed side by side. Reusable. Uh, reusable rockets. Now, two of them landed. They showed that video. One of them landed, but not as smoothly. It was going something like 300 miles an hour when it hit the ocean. So that one is not going to be reused. But this technology, its uh, they're showing that by using rockets and reusing rockets, um, they can make space flight less expensive. And of course, SpaceX is owned by Elon Musk. Elon Musk also owns Tesla. And so he took advantage of this little bit of technology to show off the Tesla in space. And that Tesla is still in space. It's in orbit about as far away from the sun as Earth and then Mars, and it's going to sort of do that for about 15 million years. It's going to be space junk at some point, it, I guess. It may already be space junk. It depends who you ask. All right, let's get uh, to the last story, the top and big story in outer space, which was, of course, uh, the Mars InSight lander, which did an amazing job landing. Yes. And then pretty quickly started sending back some great pictures. Yeah, yeah it sent back pictures right away. So uh, it, basically, it's it's um, when NASA wants to do something, they like to take their time. They like to, everything to go slowly and methodically and carefully, but when you land on Mars, you have no choice but to do it as fast as possible. Your spacecraft is going, you know, extremely fast. You got to slam on the brakes and somehow land on the surface. They call it the seven minutes of terror. Mm -hmm. That's what they, that's, it's entry, descent, and landing. And that spacecraft managed to use its heat shield and then a parachute and then thrusters and land successfully on the surface. And it lucked, I mean, they know what they're doing, but they had a general idea where it was going to land. But now that they know exactly where they stuck the landing, they can see that the ground around the lander is nice and flat, and it's perfect for the experiments they're going to do. And the experiments themselves aren't re I mean, it doesn't even drive around. It's just staying right where it is. It's going to measure earthquakes, or I guess Mars quakes, as they call them. It's going to measure the temperature of the ground and how temperature is leaking out of it. And it's basically got something like a souped up sort of GPS, so it can measure exactly what its position is relative to the Earth, so they can see how much the planet wobbles to figure out what's inside of it. So the, the science it's going to do, not as exciting, but the uh, they'll learn all the important things that the real nerds want to know about the planet. But that landing is really what gets everybody so excited. Yeah, you said not so exciting, but I think it is. I mean, just the images that came back were interesting interesting to see even for the layperson. Well, that's just it. And the, the camera is not even one of the main scientific instruments. It's just there to sort of look around to see where they put the scientific experiment. But that is how we live. And, and that's what's so interesting about spaceflight now. I mean, we still send humans to the International Space Station. Ultimately, we do want to send humans to Mars. But we're using spacecraft to go farther than we've ever imagined. And so all the planets in the solar system are getting, you know, we've flown by Pluto. We've been to Jupiter. We've been to Saturn. Uh, we're going to Mercury, all these places. And if you've got a good camera, uh, it's almost like going there. Dan Riskinser, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you.